So this is session two. Go right uh, from the start. Ensuring re reproducibility confirmation. Now this one's going to be a little bit of a struggle because a challenge because each presenter only gets ten minutes. <laughs> and so we're going to work hard to keep them on that. Um, but again, we've asked them to come up with kind of key takeaways. So watch for those, and those are also available in the, in the Dropbox or in the box folder. So our presenters are Susan Durham who is a statistical consultant, Watershed Sciences, in the College of Natural Resources, and she will start. And we have Dave Bolton, an assistant professor of kinesiology and health and science. Is that right? And then we have Richard Cutler, math and statistics professor. And we have David Rosenberg, civil environmental engineering. So take it away. faces left through the break, but that's okay. They see a lot of me. Um, I'm Susan Durham. I'm staff in the Ecology Center. I consult with graduate students and faculty on the design, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of their research. Um, my clientele comes from the Natural Resources College, the Department of Biology, and Ecology Center of Facebook. So um, I am specifically hired to help those people with their stuff. I have a background in biology and ecology, so um, that's been a big help as I've uh, been communicating with my clients. And I have a master's in applied statistics from Utah State University. I have been at this for about 30 years now. So um, I'm the first to lead off, I allegedly have 10 minutes. I've already told Anne, she's not allowed to like tell me off. Each of us will be presenting three takeaway points. I have the advantage of being able to be the one that is like everybody's first takeaway point. Planning ahead. And I rearranged my thing, but then I forgot to give it to me. Anyway, um, let me flip forward real fast here. What I'm going to do in my um, time here is go through this overall framework of a uh, flow for a scientific research project. And um, you'll note this lovely quote that I have at the top. It's really very true. We can reanalyze a set of data, but we can't recollect it. And um, throughout all of this, well, I'm a statistician. A lot of this is focused on data. But since they invited a statistician, I'm going to talk about things statistical. Statistics is a science. And that statistical science goes, runs all through this flow chart at just about every step. And um, hopefully, you'll see that as we go through. So my takeaway points, the first one, plan ahead. Everybody's really surprised about that one. Um, although I will say, going back a little bit, if you do plan ahead, you will reduce, although probably not eliminate, um, some very, the possibility of some very unpleasant surprises. Like having your statistician tell you, oh, isn't that lovely? You have no replication. <laughs> or finding yourself two months out from your defense and realizing that you need to read and implicate and implement a really complicated statistical analysis. And you don't really have the time to do that. So you're going to um, save yourself a lot of hassle. The second takeaway point is don't underestimate how much effort this is going to take. Um, you want to, this is true at all steps in that flow chart. We'll be stepping through that one by one real quickly. But in particular, the data screening, the data cleaning, the data exploration, and the statistical analysis. That is going to take you a whole lot longer than you think. Um, most of the burden will fall to you to do this work. I am a statistical consultant. I am not your personal data analyst. And so um, you will be the one you know, conducting these things, running the software. So embrace this challenge and plan for the time that it's going to take. 
If you have planned ahead, then this handy dandy. Ah, if you have planned ahead, then you will have acquired this methodology that you need to know. And we were talking a little bit about do you do analyses in Excel? I'm really draconian about that. I'm like, no. All your data manipulation, all your data cleaning is done in a scripting language like R or Python or whatever you want to do. But you also need to learn data manipulation methodology, data visualization, and data analysis. The third point is draw upon the expertise of others. Do not try to do this all yourself. We are all here in a community to support each other. And so don't be shy about going to talk to people. Um, your advisor and your committee, your statistician, if you are lucky enough to have one, qualitative, quantitative colleagues, the research data management people at the library, Betty's gonna say a bit more about that, the writing center. Most of us are probably scientists. If we wrote well, we would be in another field. Okay. So develop collaborations early with statisticians, context experts, people that can help you with reproducibility, um, and just get those established way early, and then work with these people throughout the whole of your career. Um, those of you with access to stat consultants will be my people, people associated with the Ag Experiment Station, people associated with the College of Education and Human Services, like Tyson, who spoke earlier. Um, but the rest of you are going to be a bit more challenged to find statistics. So we will step through this. First one, define the scientific question. Seek a lot of input from a lot of different sources, in particular statisticians. I'm a little biased. Um, at this next step, you identify what are you, what metrics are you going to do that address your research question? You're going to define the data collection protocol, the sampling protocol, or the experimental protocol. Obviously, a highly statistically dependent step. The next one, what analysis methods are you going to apply to your data? Depends upon the study design, depends upon the data characteristics. And it needs to answer the question that you said, oh, wrong button, that you said there. So um, you want to be effective. You do not want to be dangerous. You want to understand the methodology that you're using. And you're still pretty early in your research process. The next step is one of my favorites. I will admit, I don't make people do this a lot, but I may change my mind. Um, Many years ago on an old stat news group, Ronald Crozier wrote, no one should ever do an experiment without, anal without analyzing it first. So how do we do that? Well, we simulate data. We simulate data that looks like the data that you are expecting. And then you analyze it with these new tools that you've learned how to use. And then you see whether the results are evident. And if there's something about the process that's broken, you go back to the first step or the second step and you run through it again. You redesign your study. But if everything looks good, then you get to collect your data. It's the really fun part. Now the advantage of doing this thing with the simulated data is that you have to think extensively about the data that you're going to be collecting. You get to be the scientist, and you need to think about what is it going to look like. You also learn all the tools that you're going to need to work with it. And you also assess the power of your study. You've got, like, you're accomplishing a lot of things right there. And it's really easy to simulate data now. So that's cool. OK, collect data. Don't underestimate the amount of time it's going to take you to get those data into le electronic form. Do not underestimate the amount of time that it's going to take you to clean and screen and explore your data. There's um, just this year, there's a young career researcher, um, got it, at, uh, and she's had to retract three papers early in her career, three papers formally retracted because the data set that she got from a collaborator had serious and unresolvable problems. You do not want to be that person. 
I know, it's really sad. And from personal experience, I can tell you, you actually spend more time if you don't scream and have to come back around and do all your analysis over again. Just saying. Um, okay, so here, you, this is the really fun part. You get to analyze your data. You're also checking assumptions, um, goodness of fit. With the actual data in hand, you may find out that that's not actually, your plans aren't going to work. So you go back and you fix those and go forward again. And then you're at the end, sort of. Communication is the goal. There's no point in doing this work if nobody ever learns it. So you need to hone your verbal and written skills. That's why I listed the writing center on that one slide. And at this step, you are translating your statistical results into a story, a really good story. Straightforward, clear, but you're still making sure that the reader of your story understands the uncertainty that still remains in your study. So you're telling an honest story. So in my 10 minutes, my point is, if you plan ahead and devote time and effort to that, and you devote sufficient time and effort, you work extensively with other people, you will have increased the likelihood that your study will be successful. So go forth and do science. <laughs> That's the end of my comments. Um, I think Dan Bolton is up next. So anyway, thank you. This is forward. So it's very simple. Forward, back, and the feet Just little. Forward. Yeah. Or you could also do it there. Like that. Yeah. Sweet, huh? Sure. No, this part. This part I don't know how to work. Now is it just on All right, well, I was uh, coming back from Ireland at about 30 hours without sleep when I gave these slides to Mike, so I hope they still make sense. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll try to work through it. Um, now, one of the things that I'm going to discuss today is that I've, how many people here have heard of the uh, registered report? So a few people. So I've actually published a registered report. It came out in the journal Cortex last year. So what I thought I would actually talk about today is really we're all going to be hitting on the, the, the bullet of plan ahead. So this is a, a way of, it's a formalized version of plan ahead. So the journal forces you to get all of your, your ducks in a row here. And this right now, this is for the journal Cortex I published with. And what they, I'm going to try this out. Oh, oh, wrong one. Gotcha, okay. So this is kind of the editorial triage. And you start at the, the beginning here, you put in stage one, you submit your introduction and your methods. And based on do you have sound rationale for doing this study? Is it an important question? Are your hypotheses clear? And are your methods appropriate for answering that question? So based on that, the journal will decide to accept or reject your paper. And one of the nice things about this is now I can tell you this was a pretty long process. This is the first time I had gone through this. It took a couple years after going back with different versions of this, so I learned a lot through it. Um, but the nice thing is all of the, the effort is on the front end here. So once they've accepted this in stage one, so long as you do what you say you are going to do, even if you get uh, negligible results here, they will still publish this, which is actually a pretty important finding. Um, so I'll go through what I'm going to talk about today is I'll use the example. I'm, I'm going to not, I'll try to not uh, dig into the details too largely, only the ones that are maybe relevant to understand what I did. But so I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, which, and uh, as a lot of neuroscientists, I use t-tests and, and ANOVAs, um, anything more complicated. I just run to the stats department and quickly bring someone on. And in this case, 
what I brought on right off the bat and enlisting the help of professionals, I brought on Sarah Schwartz, who is a statistician with the College of Education. So I brought her on the paper to help us at the front end design this, because we had to, for this kind of uh, registered report, you actually have to have, if you've ever seen the power calculations that go into what sample size do you need, uh, a common marker is 80% power. For this, you actually have to have 90% power. So meaning you have to have a very large sample size to ensure that you're gonna, if there's an effect, you're gonna, you're gonna capture it with your analysis. And one of the things, so I look, oh, and the other thing, you actually have to have very clearly established hypotheses going in. So they don't want you, they wanna make sure that you're not sending in 20 primary outcome measures and gonna pick and choose a couple after. They want you to be, you wanna to commit to what are you expecting with what particular outcome measures. And we actually included this as a figure at stage one to show visually what was our expectation with our data. And now, even though I'm showing you a registered report, this is actually something I like to do for any, any paper I do anyways. I always like to visually see what is it that I would expect if, if this study runs the way I would expect. Now, as a, as a neuroscientist, I look at the, the neural control of balance, which is to say, what does the brain do to keep us from falling down, which sounds easy, it's actually very complicated. And what we do is we actually have to take people and throw them off balance and look at what the brain does. Now, I'm gonna go through a couple, I'm gonna dig into a couple details of my work just to show you one of the things that we had to do with this registered report is the idea of building in a positive control. And so in this study, what we did is we had people, they're on a harness. The harness is attached by a cable to a magnet on the back wall. They're leaning. I can release them at a certain point, and we can look at the reactive step to avoid a fall. Now, what we do is we want to see what's the role of higher brain processes in avoiding the fall. So we actually occlude vision. We do this. I think it might be the next slide. Let me look at it. Nope. We occlude vision. We play a bit of a shell game on them, meaning that we'll either put a leg block out there and uncover a handle or vice versa. We want to see what does the brain do in advance of a fall to actually help you avoid that fall. How we look at that, we use a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. In a nutshell, this allows us to take a quick snapshot of that brain connectivity from the part of the brain that controls the hand muscles. We want to see does that get facilitated just if you see something that's going to help you avoid the fall, like a, like a support handle. And what we do is we have people in this setting where they're about to get released occasionally. We, the moment they open up the goggles that we can occlude vision with, we put in this snapshot to get the idea of what's going on in the brain if it either sees the handle or it doesn't. And our outcome measure is simply this, what's called the motor vote potential, the amplitude of it. And that is that hypothesis slide you saw earlier. It was simply the amplitude of that peak, that motor vote potential. Now, what we had to convince the reviewers of is the fact that we are actually in our study. We're going to find something. We weren't pulling this out of, out of thin air. We actually had a foundation from prior work that is leading us to suspect that the brain is doing this predictive priming based on vision. And what had been shown before is people, if they're simply, they're, they're purely relaxed, but they're, they're sitting there, they're looking at an object that could be picked up with a pinch grip, and in the moment, so at about a tenth of a second, after seeing this object, if it's there or not, if it's there, you get a facilitation of the muscles that would normally interact with it. So it's an immediate priming associated just with looking at that object. Now, we thought this would have implications for the world of balance control, so that you get this automatic priming of something that would help you avoid a fall if you did fall. Now, what we had to build upon is the fact that this finding showed that people just purely looking would get that facilitation. And so what we had to do here is we had to find, in our case, we're looking at how this really plays out with a whole body postural reaction targeted to a handle to avoid a fall. But what we had to build into our study was we had to, this is the, the positive control that we're looking at. And what we had people do, purely sitting down they would either see that handle or not. So again, we'd occlude vision. All of a sudden, they get vision. The handle's either there or it's covered. And 
based on the visibility of that handle, we look at is there an intrinsic facilitation or a facilitation of these intrinsic hand muscles. And that is the effect that we have to replicate in order to then test our experimental condition, the, 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 the fancy new exciting thing that we want to test. We have to build upon the foundation of what's established. And so this was, for the registered report, actually a required thing. You actually have to have an outcome neutral, positive control built into your study such that if we did get uh, negligible findings in our experimental condition, we can at least show that we have basic competence or what we're doing, we can replicate the established effect that we are building upon. So even though that was formalized in the registered report, I think this is a good idea. You can, you can certainly always add this to any study that you, you are gonna do. And it saves you two minutes, excellent. And, and it saves you work uh, down the road if you actually get this correct up front. So I think my, I think my three points were plan ahead. And then uh, uh, if you can, if possible, a lot of journals do have this format. I think it's becoming more popular, a, a pre-registration process. So I encourage you to do it. It's, you probably can't do every study like this because it does take a lot of time up front. But if you can get some major studies in the pipeline that build this up, I think it's a good idea. And even if you're not gonna do a pre-registration, the idea of building in a positive control to test your, your new experimental effect is something that will safeguard you from the review process later on. So that's it for me. Well, greetings, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, just want to say it's been a real pleasure for the last 30 years interacting and talking with Susan. And um, <clears throat> just listening to what she presented, I recognize just how much we have in common in our viewpoint of the universe. There really is a statistician's viewpoint. So, and, and PowerPoint framework, yeah. I'm wondering what button I press to get rid of these lines here. Sorry. Never mind. <clears throat> okay, so, um, you know, at the risk of it seeming like an ego trip, I thought I'd uh, just put up something to tell you a little bit about me because it, it tells you where I'm coming from. And um, so I'm one of the professors in the math and stat department and um, been a statistician. I was hired in 1988, so I've been here quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> I've been working collaboratively with researchers in many different disciplines. Um, for a number of years, but um, something that's perhaps most relevant to our discussion today is that I spent three years running the Statistical Consulting Center in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, and in that three-year period, I worked on approximately 250 problems from every single college at Utah State University. Now, going into it, there were places where I expected to see people coming from, College of uh, Natural Resources, College of Education, um, College of Engineering. What I was struck by was how pervasive the analysis of data is. And it also gave me a fine appreciation for the range of um, <coughs> uh, research that goes on at Utah State. So coming over to the consulting center, um, <coughs> sometimes I'd see faculty Mainly it was graduate students um, who were sent up to by their advisors, and um, so I got to speak with a lot of different people. So I work on um, the application of statistical methods in a bunch of different areas, um, one of which, or perhaps the largest one of which, is 
um, ecological and environmental uh, statistics. And um, I'm also uh, someone who knows quite a lot about the design and analysis of experiments. And so um, <coughs> that would be uh, an area. The um, area that I'm really, I would say, most conversant with at this point in time is um, what we call statistical learning or machine learning. The two terms are absolutely interchangeable. And um, those are absolutely plumb in uh, the center of what we call data science these days. So statistics, all statistics is data science. The converse is not necessarily true. So I want to tell you, I want to, unlike uh, previous and, and other presenters, I want to get right down in the weeds, okay? So I've got a trowel and I'm, I'm digging up, uh, you know, the cheat grass and, and other stuff, which is um, <coughs> in, the, in the paddock. And so here's a, an example. It's a, it's a cautionary tale. It's something that actually came in to the Statistical Consulting Center when I was working there. So 12 um, soil cores were taken and go down in the ground a couple of feet and um, pull out a core of soil. Um, each core was split into uh, three different levels. So the top was two to five centimeters, and the middle was seven to 10 centimeters down, and the bottom was 12 to 15 centimeters down. So 15 centimeters is about six inches. Right? And um, the 12 portions at each depth were then combined, because um, it's 12 different cores, and thoroughly mixed. And um, so then 36 samples from each depth um, were drawn and they were randomly assigned to, it says each treatment, two treatments, there are only two treatments in the experiment. So 18 to each treatment and at each depth and for each treatment and for each of six different times, three samples are randomly selected and the testing involves, you know, figuring out chemical composition and so we have to leach those elements out with acids and so it's a destructive uh, sampling process. And so it's obviously a very sophisticated experimental design. Right? And some of you may have seen things similar to this. And clearly someone put in, well, some people put in a tremendous amount of thought into constructing this experimental design. Um, I spoke with the person who actually did the work, um, a graduate student, and um, a staggering amount of effort went into implementing the design and collecting the data. And the student's advisor and committee signed off on this design. And it's actually a terrible design. And um, along the way, you know, there was one uh, level of replication which never was in the design or the experiment. And there was another level that was completely exploded by mixing um, all samples together. There was a logistical reason for doing that. And that was that, um, you know, if they just did one um, particular core, there simply wasn't enough to come up with 36 different samples. And so many of the traditional methods that we would apply to data like these, traditional analysis of variance techniques and so on, simply weren't valid. And so, um, you know, we cobbled together something, but um, it's a real euphemism to say that the analysis did not meet the students' um, desires or expectations on this particular problem. It was really sad. And that was a big, um, uh, one of the uh, big messages of, of my time in the consulting center was that, um, you know, it was really hard sometimes to tell someone, you know, your study was flawed from the beginning. As we've heard before, you can't fix it with um, doing some statistics after the fact. I've encountered, you know, maybe 10 or 12 out of those 250 where I really had to tell a person, look, there's not much I can do for you except draw some pictures and, and uh, things along those lines. You know, your um, <coughs> study was flawed at the beginning and we can't do um, any inferential statistics. So, you know, a couple of years later, I got some extant data and uh, I had a graduate student working with me and she worked really hard on this problem. And we came up with a better analysis um, for it, but boy, we had to make some heroic assumptions and it still wasn't satisfactory. The design was simply not fixable. And really, if the person had come to see Susan or me or you know someone who um, could have advised them on this, 
we could have avoided um, all of this particular problem and really uh, a very unfortunate situation. So a couple of thoughts about uh, data analysis. Um, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes, you know, you have a nicely designed study and you just pock it in, put it into Proconova and SAS and boom, out comes the, uh, the, the answer. Um, that happens about once every 20,000 studies. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, uh, the data analysis can be much harder than you think. And uh, that's something that it behooves you to come to grips with um, before you actually conduct the study. So this is getting back to the plan ahead. This is the topic that we all agree on is planning ahead. Um, so that you don't get these nasty surprises, that are potentially unfixable surprises right at the end. So it's very important to know the details of the analysis. And um, Susan said she doesn't, uh, she doesn't often recommend that people generate fake data. Um, I've been lucky in some of the examples that I've had that I've, my, my collaborators and I have looked around and said, ah, you know, this data set looks quite a lot like what we're going to do. And so we've been lucky. You know, we've been able to practice on a real data set. But, you know, the idea of actually getting down, I mean, this is really at the nuts and bolts and the weeds and um, uh, <clears throat> uh, generating some fake data so that you can practice your analysis, I think is very important. And in this uh, thing here of the details, you know, I think, uh, I want to try this just once. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> Love new technology. Um, so in, you know, in the level of the details, I mean, there's a lot of data science techniques these days which people hear about and you know, classification trees, gradient boosting machines, um, random forests, and they sound so sexy and yes, we want to apply them um, to our data set. And so I've read so many passages in, in proposals saying this is what I want to do. I'm going to apply random forests to this and I'm gonna do this, that, and the next thing. And um, it's not good enough because, you know, these techniques require to have data limitations and, um, you know, you have to be aware of those. So usually there are multiple methods, perhaps multiple approaches for analyzing the same data. Um, reinforcing something Susan said, learn as much as you can about the techniques that you're going to use. You need to own the data analyses that are part of your thesis or dissertation. And you can do that by taking classes, by looking at online resources, and by talking with people who have expert knowledge in this area. I'm a faculty, I'm a consultant um, like um, Susan and others. And I think that's all I want to say for the moment. Can you all hear me? My name is David Rosenberg. I'm an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering. And my research focuses on water management, which is all about how we can operate reservoirs, um, dams, diversions, um, how we can try and get in the heads of users, all of us to conserve water, and to do that for a bunch of different purposes. Um, for example, in one application, we're using uh, Tree rings, we reconstructed stream flows going all the way back to 1480. Um, and we've done that actually at a monthly uh, level, even though trees only grow one year, one ring per year. Um, and Noor Atella, whose photo on the far, um, your far right, is um, setting up a meter and register at the water lab that records water use every five seconds. And when you can record water use, and you're starting to now get the idea of big data, um, at every five seconds, you can 
see how long people take showers for, how many times a day they flush the toilet, how many uh, gallons each flushes, and lots of other really cool stuff, outdoor water use. So this type of data, we do a lot of modeling as well, um, has gotten me into the area of reproducibility because kind of reproducibility is at the forefront of science in every science field. What is reproducibility? The idea that we collected the data, if we make that data and model code available, someone else can use those exact artifacts and they can reproduce the results. They can get the same results that, that we got and we can actually verify um, that what's going on is, is good. So my first main takeaway point, that's actually like the way end of the spectrum on the continuum and the reality of 2020, science in my field and actually in many other fields is that we're not even here like on this first one yet. Um, how many of you have finished a research project? Just raise your hand. Keep your hand raised if you also made all the data that you collected in that project, all the models and code, the results available for others to use like publicly on the internet more easily. I'm not seeing any hands. <laughs> and that is also the reality from what I'll show you in a second. So the instructions and all the other digital artifacts. That's just step one here, right, is making the stuff available. Then if stuff is available, we can come to step two, which is what I started my few minutes talking about, which is actually, can we reproduce the results? Can you get the same results as shown in the figures and tables and other texts? Like, is that process um, reproducible? And then finally, I'll say like, we're probably a decade or more away from step three, which is can we replicate the findings, which means can we use new data sets and in new locations and maybe at different points in time to come up with like the same general conclusion about what we were seeing in step two. And so reproducibility is a continuum and I went the wrong way on the continuum. <laughs> um, I'm still going the wrong way. <laughs> and I just want you to think about how can I push my work up the continuum? It's not get to reproducible results or findings recordable, it's just how can I even get on the continuum or maybe move a step or two up? And every step that any good idea that you've heard today so far has been about like making our spreadsheets more readable and being able to keep track of which file we should be opening I mean, these are all efforts at working up those continuums. Let me make sure I go the right direction. Okay, so how can I make my results reproducible? I'm, this is the question you should be asking, or I want you to be asking. And this number one, build reproducibility into the project from the start. You've heard this one twice, at least twice today. But I wanna add on a few more things which is you have to budget the time to do all this because it does take time. And you have to have money, right, to pay people to do this or sometimes to buy storage like on cloud storage in order to host all your data. You have to think through, like we were talking about registering research designs um, in a previous talk or two talks previous. And you have to think about if you're going to involve in human subjects, your research involves human subjects, so how can I go through the international or institutional review board process, which governs um, human subject research, in a way that I can potentially share some of the data that I'm collecting? And this is like confidential data. How can I do that in a way? You need to think about that ahead of time. You can't do it at the end of the study because all the agreements were already signed and all the restrictions were in place. And what other tools, software and um, data management and other tools can help? Okay, number two, <clears throat> put all your materials in a repository. 
and preferably in one repository for the project so they're all co-located in a place where people can, um, can see. And the repository that you will choose, the location, maybe it's, um, maybe it's Digital Commons, right, the university's online repository. Maybe it's a field or a repository specific to your field. In my field, um, we have HydroShare, which is like, it's like social media for hydrologists. Um, and that's also a good option. We also use GitHub a lot, which is for code, to help you share um, code. And one of the cool things about these repositories is it's not just a bin that you dump stuff in at the end of your project. You're actually building this container. And as you go through your project, everything goes into it. And at the end, you hopefully don't have to do a huge amount of work in order to, to share it. OK. Um, number three, make all your inputs and outputs, um, particularly a proprietary work. So that's software where you have to buy licenses to use that someone else who's wanting to use reproduce your work is not going to have the license to use. Um, or it's maybe private with IRB or computationally intensive. Um, you want to make sure all those steps in that process are available, all the materials are both before and after the step that, that uses the proprietary code or um, maybe it's computationally intense, the steps that people won't be able to reproduce. Give them everything that led up to that and everything that resulted from that. <coughs> Number four, how many of you, when you write a paper, an article, or a report, ask someone else to like look at it and give you feedback on it? Yes? No? Good. Yes, a lot of yeses. We need to do the same thing for our repositories. They're actually quite complicated. They have a lot of text in it, a lot of different materials. Can someone follow through all the steps? That's the gold standard. You know, you actually reproduce your work because someone else can, can get through and they get the same result. And we've been increasingly um, building that into my own research group's practice, meaning that I have one graduate student check the work of another graduate student before we submit the paper. OK, number five, train students, employees, and reproducible and employees and reproducible practices. This is why I'm here today, right now, this minute, talking to all of you, right? That's what the data palooza is for. We have to do a lot of work to get everyone up to speed, to have the skills and the training and the intuition about how to how to do this. If you want 42 more other tips, um, <laughs> we just have out actually a new editorial titled um, uh, Making Research More Reproducible. It appears in the Journal of uh, Water Resource Planning Management, which is the flagship journal of, I know I'll say that in blank, <laughs> but I can't take evidence of that, for the American Society of Civil Engineers. I mean, that's the society that governs civil engineers in the United States, the big organization. They publish 30 other journals as well. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. OK. Um, I have a minute left, so I'm going to skip to this slide. In order to do all this, like this is a ton of work. And it's a ton of effort, and it requires a lot of people who care. And in order to create a culture where we actually start reproducing the results, it's going to take all of us, and not just us. Us as authors, the journals that are publishing the work that authors are working in, for example, the, um, the registering uh, reports ahead of time. It takes institutions like Utah State University and other universities around the country and the world. It also takes federal agencies, and it takes funders. And we together all have to be coordinating these things so that we can actually have science that is reproducible and that, um, that we can make hopefully replicable in the, in the future. So with that, I'll finish. Um, I think, where are we headed next? Questions? Okay. If we come back up. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask about? 
I know, I, I only know about this because I know somebody who's in the program, but like the College of Education here has a program for teachers of STEM students or like engineering teaching. Are you guys working at that level, like trying to get high school students to be thinking, you know what I mean? Like, like ingraining the idea of part of the scientific method is this, you know, like when it comes down to it, like this is part of the scientific method. I don't, I don't have any interaction with high school students. I, I run and participated in code camps where we bring high school students on the university to, to code in uh, Python or um, in other languages on, a, on water resources problems. Um, that's been my main, main interaction with high school students. I think at that stage, the primary motivation like from a STEM perspective is just to get people interested and excited about coding and working with data and trying to wrestle with um, with problems. Like the problem we gave students was Pine View Reservoir on the Weber River. Um, it's about like 40 miles south of here. Just how should they construct release rules, how much water to release from the reservoir um, to, to supply different users and prevent people from getting flooded. And um, the group came up with some cool, pretty cool Examples. One group decided it was really cool to flood everyone. <laughs> and because it's a computer model and it's a coding environment, they could, of course, do that. <laughs> we have a fair interaction um, <clears throat> among the staff faculty with high schools, you know, presenting, trying to get them interested in taking AP statistics and so on. But it's not at this level, right? It's really at the level of trying to get them interested in data and the things that we do with data. And then, you know, if they go much further, then they're going to start encountering some of these issues of reproducibility and, uh, and replication. So I have a question for Dr. Gerram. Uh, you talked about the importance of screening and exploring the data before analysis. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you mean by screening and exploring the data? Uh, when Tyson said cleaning, to some extent, it's that. So you look, you look for unusual data values. They might be typographical errors. They might be cut and paste errors. Um, just to verify that all of the data that is in your data set are legitimate. But I, I also do tabulations. So people bring me data sets all the time. And most of them have errors in them. Um, they, they've gotten things wrong in their Excel data set. So they've got two observations for this treatment combination when they should only have one. Um, and so you're, you're cleaning, screening, cleaning, um, things like that. The, um, and then summarizing, like then you start to do like histograms or uh, descriptive statistics, minimums, maximums, plots that are um, that illustrate the relationships that you are looking for in your data set. Just pretty much whatever, you know, the first step is to get good numbers to where you're pretty sure that every number in that data file is not wrong. <laughs> but then we move forward into exploration. Um, there's a quote in one of Frank Harrell's books that goes something along the line of that failure to look at your data before, or looking at your data before you do the analysis is almost as bad as failing to do so. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, I've had people come and say, well, and I'll say, did you like this? Your data, not well. I thought that was cheating. And, well, actually, no, it's just dumb. Not <laughs> but it's also hard too. Like if your data set's really big, you can't actually ever that. ever look at all the I mean, all the values and figuring out ways to wrangle. That, yeah, because because you can't necessarily look at every single data value. Mm -hmm. But you can you can this example that I gave of this this woman who's retracted the papers. Um, there's probably some data falsification going on in these data sets. And she did an extensive screening. Um, but it didn't show up. It didn't show up until people, I mean, basically she was clued into it by somebody else. And it didn't show up until she looked for exactly that pattern. 
and it was just too many, too many little blocks of data with all the same value. But she'd already summarized the data because it was a really big data set. So she'd already done means and things like that, and they didn't show up. You can't be too careful or too skeptical, basically. When in doubt, assume the worst. But that's what I mean. Does that answer your can yes. answer your question? And it's going to be specific to your context and the nature of your data. Um, but the first point is to get good, clean data, good data quality, and then start to look for patterns in the data that, that you are interested in ultimately finding. And try to be honest, not being you know, not being too cheeky about it. But but it's crazy not to do that. You want you want to add anything? Well, just an anecdote, you know, we did the hip fracture project, elderly people, asked them how many hours of, uh, a week of hard physical activity do you do? That could include, um, you know, working in the yard and, and um, uh, cleaning house and so on. And um, when we summarized the data, because we were conscientious about this, the largest value was 98, 98 hours a week. So that's 14 hours hard physical labor per day, seven <laughs> days a week. <laughs> yeah. And I, okay, no, go ahead. I think you have to flip the question. Like, it's not, is my data okay and I'm proving it wrong? You have to prove that your data is right and good. Yeah. Like, you start from the assumption that I basically have crap. <laughs> Even though you spend a lot of time and effort. Well, in our case, it's you did a lot of model runs in order to, or uh, they maybe took a lot of time, or you took a lot of time programming the model, but you have to question it or come from the perspective of I don't trust this, and the data has to earn my trust instead of the reverse of the data has to disprove or under my trust. What if the data isn't your own data? It's data that the government produce it's data that you're pulling from then, then you're in a world of I mean you are in for it oh, or <laughs> seriously <laughs> yeah. because as you've discovered the formats are all over the place yeah. um, the quality of the data is highly suspect <coughs> they haven't documented it like they they need mm -hmm. to you may not even know what it is I always warn my clients that if they're relying upon collaborators especially bureaucratic collective that it's going to be hard. It's going to be very time-consuming yeah. to pull the data together. Yeah, and one, one point I can add to that. So the reason I was in Ireland is because there's a data set they have there that has thousands of older adults. I look at falls and older adults. They have brain scans from lots and lots of older adults over 10 years that might be certain brain markers might be predictive of fall risk. Now, they've actually got lots and lots of data, including things like grip strength. Now, what we found out by kind of during these meetings is that they were quite variable in how they collected grip strength. So it's weirdly grip strength is a, is a marker of frailty and even a cognitive function. It's not just a basal strength measure, but if people do it with their arm supported, it's not as challenging versus this. So to get maximal strength by controlling all these joint torques is actually more challenging. So you'll get a different answer depending on how you do this. We wouldn't have known that unless we kind of dug into the weeds and found out that this was a problem. So we're not going to use grip strength for that data. Um, the other things are usable, but that's an example of, I don't know if you didn't have that meeting with the people. I don't know how you get that, uh, but it's something to be cautious about. Well, you can also see it. I mean, this is the core question of reproducibility, right? Can you actually access and use Data there or results that other people have um, been available, in this case, the government, right? Mm -hmm. But you will also become the government because at some point you're going to publish your results and you want other people to sh share your results and to use your results, right? That's the sign of a really good, uh, successful scientific endeavor. And so, my suggestion would be is as you struggle with using other people's data, which is a real struggle, and it goes on, then it's hard. We wrestle with it in my field a lot because we're not the primary data collectors in most cases. Um, the water conservation project was a rare exception for us. Uh, just to pay attention to what you actually need 
from those data providers and those study providers in order to be able to read to use their materials in a in a way in your own work. And then of course hopefully to carry that forward or address those issues when you when you turn your results out. I've had better experience. Oh, I'm sorry. If I could just say a couple of things. Yeah, I've had I've had good experiences with government data. Um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Bureau of the Census. Um, they are meticulous in documenting stuff, and so you might wonder why in the world and it may be buried somewhere in a you know a two point type uh, footnote somewhere in, on page 693, but it's there. The information is actually there, and the quality of the data. Is very high. It's as good as it could possibly be. Most recently with CDC on um, flu type uh, things. And again, the quality of the data is, is not bad, um, and the quality of the documentation is fantastic. I guess I was just thinking about this reproducibility thing in, in, in the case of human subjects research, where a lot of data sometimes comes from videographic sources and things and watching videos of these people. We have signed informed consents and IRB documents, mm -hmm. which I can't see a case where those videos could necessarily ever be made totally public. So I guess my question is, do you think it'll, is it, will it ever be so serious about this reproducibility thing that human subjects will, um, you know, be required to give consent to make their video of themselves publicly available? Or will it never reach into even that, that level of, um, so great question. So my work intersects IRB when we put sensors on the water meters going to people's houses or their facilities. And um, you know, we want to know how long they shower for, <laughs> things like that. So I've had a chance to think about this a lot. And I think if you're thinking like, so first of all, an IRB study that's or protocol that's already been done in the past, um, it's going to be very hard to change that, right? To come in after the fact and to get people to consent to do something that it's already hard enough to get them to consent to participate in a study to begin with. Um, and so coming back after the fact is really difficult. But I do think this um, is changing. And it's changing because. We're living in a digital world where I reveal more data and information about myself to Google and to my cell phone provider and to political parties and to every, and I'm looking at the video right here behind me and this is, where is that video going, right? <laughs> and this is just the world we're moving into. So I see it changing. I think more pressing like the way people are becoming more comfortable with this and so the IRB protocols can relax. Another thing that um, in talking with Courtney uh, Flint, who's in, um, who's in the Cass College, who does a lot of um, sociology work related to, um, to water use, is that you can maybe ask for people's consent afterwards. So initially they, you sign a consent form that says, you know, oh, this is the terms of the of participating in the study, but then after the study has been done, like, oh, would you be willing to consent? It's like an additional add-on to share your video, right? The video already happened. You know, they the person knows what's in it. They know, oh, there's nothing like harmful here, and so that you can grab <coughs> that consent on maybe those particular most. Um, controversial or maybe troublesome or worrisome parts afterwards. And um, whereas if you ask someone up front, they would say no, like, no way. Yeah. Uh, I, <coughs> wow, excuse me, wrong in my throat. Is that a follow-up comment to that actually? I think the question that needs to be asked when we're working with human subjects is, what risk does this pose to the participants? So for your case, I don't know, you know what your research is or what you're videotaping, that needs to be you know, that, that, that's really the crux of it. And then to follow up, um, at some institutions, you can have additional yes, no sign offs as if it was collected as a sub study, or you could even say that this video 
we would like to add as part of our as a, a repository, <coughs> do you consent to that yes or no? And then just one other additional follow-up. With the advancements in facial recognition and blurring, <coughs> it's becoming relatively easier to mask people's identity. I mean, at least visually, you know, and then voice change and stuff like that. So there is some ways we can mm -hmm. limit the some level of potential risk. Um, just keep a thought. Yeah, I mean, we did on a study that was part of the IUTOP project, which is a big, large institu institutional interview, uh, water project for Utah. They interviewed some 2,000 people households up and down the Wasatch Front on a, like a survey. And then they connected that to the participants' build watering, watering use. And my group wasn't involved in either of those parts, but we were able to access the data in an unanonymized un un form. And that let us bring in the landscape coverage data, which we could then tell how much turf area people had, and how much trees, and what their get a better sense of their outdoor warriors. And then we also got permission after the fact to share the anonymized version of that study with everyone um, or post it online. And to do that, to actually follow through on those terms, we had to mask. So you were talking about video blurring of images. Mm -hmm. We had to, I mean, we could measure the land, the grass turf area on every plot down to a few square meters, but we had to mask that up to 30 square meters so that there were at least like three or four other households in um, in Logan and there's about 40,000 uh, or 10,000 uh, households in Logan so that you, know, you couldn't identify which house we were talking about. So I think, yeah, I mean, that sounds very, very, very doable. You know, one, one thing to keep in mind too with human subjects um, data Depending on the population that you're working with, some of this data, especially if it's a very sensitive population, some of the data is really valuable. And there are places we have, we're a member of ICPSR, it's a repository. And there are ways that this data can be secured so that it, it cannot be accessed by anybody. You actually would have to go to Michigan to access this data. The reason this is important is if you're dealing with some of these populations that are very sensitive, you don't you don't want to be keep retesting them, right? They're already uh, being surveyed too much, <laughs> and by making sure that this data is kept in a place where others can utilize it, either to reproduce the results or to build upon those results, make sure that that population uh, isn't isn't tested again, and that this data is kept for, for as long as you know, as long as possible. So there are lots of options when you have human subjects to keep the human subjects safe, protected, and still allow for the data to be reused. Anonymity, I mean, anonymizing. Let's uh, <clears throat> thank our panel again.